I'd like to thank our incredible and fantastic panel for coming to join us for what I'm sure is going to be a really interesting discussion. And now I'm going to introduce our chair. She's a writer and broadcaster, a former dancer with the Royal Ballet. She ran the Lindbury Studio at the Royal Opera House for a number of years. And now she's director of cultural partnerships at King's College London. Please give a warm welcome to Deborah Bull. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here to introduce this debate, which I suspect may be as hot as its title. Um, and I think it promises to raise plenty more questions than it answers. Alliteration is always, I think, uh, in front of people's minds when they're thinking at, uh, about titles, and Hot at 100 seems to have been um, uh, partly, I think about that, that alliterative thing, sounds so much better than Hot at 69. Um, <laughs> But uh, So over the next hour, as well as hearing from this astonishingly beautiful panel, um, I, I hope we're going to touch on what exactly we mean by hot, who we might be looking hot for, and indeed the relationship between uh, how we feel about ourselves and the way we look. So I think with our panel we'll manage to touch on quite a few of those things. Um, I, I did a programme for Radio 4 a while back called After I Was Gorgeous, uh, which talked to, to models about um, life after being in the spotlight. And uh, a professor of psychology at Manchester, Professor Geoffrey Beatty, said to me, human beings crave attention and beautiful people tend to get a lot of attention. So it's fulfilling a psychological need which of course raises the question what happens it may indeed be why we try so hard to hang on to our to our beauty we'll see if everybody agrees with that um, there is a bigger question of course here about what beauty actually means we live in a culture where we don't necessarily equate age with beauty but that's only one attitude there are plenty of cultures around the world where where age is equated with beauty and indeed if you believe a rash of kind of uh, campaigns and newspaper columns at the moment, then perhaps we are changing our attitude to age and beauty. Perhaps we are beginning to see that beauty is not just skin deep and that older people indeed uh, can be viewed as beautiful. So, and of course then there's the question of attitude and style and fashion and tweaks, the things you can alter, the things you can impact, the things you can't impact. So I think with our panel, we'll, we'll touch on all of those issues. We, we've got varied views here, I know, and we do want to hear you too. Um, it's not a hugely long debate, so I'm going to try to be a fierce chair and to keep the panel in order, but also to keep you in order. So we do have microphones. I will be inviting your questions, but I will be trying to stop you if I feel you've made your point, um, just so we can get as many points in as possible. So we do have an impressive and beautiful panel, and we're going to take from each of them just a couple of minutes on a particular topic. And we're going to start with Ari Seth Cohen. Now, Ari is a fashion photographer and the creator of a blog called Advanced Style, which is devoted, and I'm quoting, to capturing the sartorial savvy of the senior set. Alliteration again, you see. All the S's. We're addicted to it. Um, he's also got a documentary called Advanced Style, which is going to be released on the 9th of May in the UK. So we're very pleased to have him here. Please welcome Ari Seth Cohen. Thank you. And, and my initial question to you is about your obsession with older women. What got you interested in photographing uh, older women? How could I not be? Look at some of the ladies on this panel. Um, my whole project is really in honor and celebration of my grandmothers who were very hardworking, intelligent, stylish, just incredible women. And they really nurtured my creativity and kind of guided everything that I'm doing now. So um, it, it started with them, really. And how did it build? How did it build? <laughs> um, one of my grandmothers told me um, as a, at a young age that if I wanted to be creative, I should move to New York City. She went to Columbia University and studied library sciences. So um, for a while, when she wasn't feeling well, I helped nurse her. And then when she passed away, I moved to New York and started noticing all these incredibly dressed, vital, creative, active, older women on the street. And I wondered, why aren't these women the women that we're paying attention to in the media? So it started out as a personal project where I just started photographing and interviewing them because I wanted that connection, like the connection I had with my own grandmother. And then I started putting them online and I started to hear from people how their um, own opinions of aging were changing based on the vitality of the women that I was photographing. So the project grew. 
really the first big thing that I did with Advanced Style was at Selfridges. I did a, a concept store and I did a whole, um, I, I shot pictures all around London of older women. So um, that's really how it's happened. And then I had a book and now the documentary is coming out. And I'm really interested in that connection between your grandmother's spirit um, and her style, because actually you've described clearly a woman who was distinctive and um, intellectually driven, yeah. which manifested itself in a physical appearance. Well, I, w one of my grandmothers was very elegant and chic, and my other grandma, who was the librarian, um, was more uh, practical with her sense of style because of her career. But um, once she retired, <laughs> we used to go shopping together, and, and she felt that freedom to do whatever she wanted. Um, yeah, and I think it, more than style, it's really about lifestyle and how both my grandmothers lived, how the women on my blog live. They kind of imbue everything they do with a sense of passion and vitality, whether that's dressing up or making art or walking their dogs or eating a sandwich or reading a book. They have this will to keep going, keep moving, and keep um, being part of the world. Brilliant. Well I, well, I know we'll come back to you, but let's, let's move on to our second um, panelist today, who uh, came relatively late in life to the limelight, joined the Ugly Models Agency in 1999 uh, at the age of 51. I'm, I'm sure you don't mind us saying your age, because no, I've got it written no, here. Um, so. You're a face that I see all the time in, in, in the papers and, and admire. Um, okay. Just some of the, the campaigns appears in, the, the, in Vogue, the Sunday Times Style, The Guardian, Marks and Spencers, and indeed Ministry of Sound. You've worked for Katy Perry, Sophie Ellis-Bexter, Mika and Emma Bunton, and you've appeared on the side of a bus. Um, yes. Which is it's normally a, a <laughs> joke. So please a give a warm <laughs> welcome to Pam Lucas. Um, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I um, started modelling at 51. I rang up the Ugly Agency actually for my son because he delegated it to me, like boys do. <laughs> And uh, they wouldn't talk to me about him because they don't do that, do they, these days? No, you, no he's, got, he's got to be proactive on his own account. So I, I had this sort of eureka moment. I had wanted to model when I was young, but I have a very... I have an Indian Catholic mother who is quite strict and, and terrified, like most of her generation, really, of the modern world. And because um, it was quite wild compared to the way she was brought up, because she'd come a long way. And... Um, so I wasn't allowed to, and at different times I didn't do it, you know, so um, I thought, oh, 51, might as well go for it. So I said, well, how about a middle-aged woman who looks a bit like Morticia Adams, because I had darker hair with this white streak, and they said, come along for an interview, and I went, it was a three-minute video audition, and they hired me, that was in 1999, and I've worked with them ever since, and I love Uglies because they're not stereotypical, they celebrate like the diversity of the human race really and uh, it's like a big family, it's fun. Yeah. Has it changed your <coughs> attitude to the way you see yourself? Oh yeah, my confidence has grown I think. Yeah, I'd never have been able to do this <laughs> before. Um, yeah, it, it's, it does help your confidence obviously when, when sort of people rehire you like they do at The Guardian, that's mm -hmm. nice. And um, <clears throat> it's fun to uh, meet lots of new young people and be out in the world. As I was saying, it sort of um, keeps you going, it keeps you alive, really. Yeah. And are you conscious of being a, a role model of, of, of somebody that's bucking a trend? Um, well, I wasn't, but lots of pe older people, and, and actually young people, come up to me in the street and say, Oh, I, I love your pictures in The Guardian. And a, a friend of my son's who didn't know that I was his mother, had like a whole ball <laughs> that was being stalked <laughs> with my pictures <laughs> on, <laughs> and, which was quite flattering in, in a way. In a weird, <laughs> in a weird way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, our, our next panellist, uh, Jean Woods, we're turning to a woman who is, as you see, no barrier at all to style, and again, a 76-year-old grandmother, um, and you appeared in the acclaimed Channel 4 documentary, Fabulous Fashionistas, um, which of course featured older people with a flair for fashion. So please welcome Jean Woods. And Jean, tell us a little bit about the afterlife of a fashionista. 
very exciting, <laughs> very exciting, meeting loads of people. And the day after Fashionista was absolutely amazing. I work in Bloomsbury as a shopping bath and uh, a lady came in and she just laid these lilies down on the counter and I waited to serve her and, and she just said, you're an inspiration. And she went out of the shop and I sort of went, what's going on? And then the bouquets arrived, sent from London. Uh, it, it was absolutely marvellous and people have oh, been really lovely to me. <laughs> One of the funny things was I was in a, um, a market with my son and uh, this woman was walking in front of me and all of a sudden she turned around and she went, oh, she said, you're Jean, Jean from the fashion industry. I said, yes. And then she went, mum, mum, she's in the flesh. <laughs> <laughs> it's like people at work are sort of really sort of buoyant about it. And I think it's lovely, but people seem to think they, they know you because they've seen you on that and everybody calls you like the big issue man, hi Jean. And I, I go, oh, hi, you know, and it's sort of, you know, it's, it's sort of like that and it's really, really been lovely. And what's amazing me as well, it's not only the older people is affected, it's the younger people as well, because they come up and one girl said, um, you've changed the nation. I said, oh, you've changed the nation? She said, well, she said, you've made us think that you can be as you want to be when you're older. You don't have to conform. Like some lady said to me, you know, I don't know what I should wear when I'm 60. I said, it's not what you should wear, it's what you could wear. You could wear anything. And people have said to me, oh, I used to love Doc Martens when I was 30, but I think I'd be embarrassed and look silly in them now. She said, but not now. She said, I've seen, I can't wear mine because I've been in an accident and, so, and my foot's swollen and I can't wear the Doc Martens. Yes, so she said, um, and she's got them out of the wardrobe and I'm swearing them again. So I think, you know, it's, it's wonderful. But I've had lots of sad letters as well. And I think it's helped people because they've been in the same circumstances as me and they've lost Paul and they've not moved on, but they feel now that they can see that they've got more courage, you know, from, from the show. I had a chap about three weeks ago, he came up to me and um, he said, you're Jean from I said, yes. And he got a hold of my hand and he kept, he didn't want to let it go, he was shaking it. He said, you were an absolute inspiration to me. And he said, and when you lit that candle for Paul, he said, I cried. But what shook me that he said, Paul, he didn't say your husband, he said, Paul. And that's what I've found as I've gone around to people. They're, they're accepting me as they, they know me and I'm their friend. I know Mark Bath's not a very big place and this most probably wouldn't happen to people in London, but it's, it's the most wonderful feeling because although Paul was gone, it seems like all these people are sort of helping me with him because, you know, it's, it's, such, a, it's such a lovely life. And I think, well, if the bubble bursts tomorrow, I've had a wonderful time. And I think as long as the, as long as the um, big issue man says hygiene, I'm quite contented. <laughs>
you step onto another planet, planet old, <laughs> where you're kind of stripped of any identifying quality that you've ever had before, any interest, any knowledge, any resources, and you become nothing but old. And I think that, you know, what we've heard so far is an absolute demonstration of, of what I think most of us know in some part of ourselves is that it isn't like that. On the other hand, the idea that we are still going to have to strive to look hot at 100, you know, past the smelling salts, you know. <laughs> the, uh, and I think we need to make a distinction between this kind of exuberance, which, you know, for someone like Jean, I mean, who I've only just met, but seems to me the way you present yourself is an expression of your vitality. And the way that there are enormous pressures, and I think they are beginning to extend to men, but I think as women we've had them, you know, very intensively, to produce oneself, you know, to have oneself as one's self-improving project. One's constantly got to make oneself look better, um, you know, that the hair needs changing, the new look, that, you know, it, it, it's an enormous expense. We expend an enormous amount of energy in, in producing ourselves. And the idea that this is going to go on for decades, you know, I, I know many women for whom they would love the idea of that, but I know many more women for whom aging, the relief of, you know, give me the sensible shoes, the flatties, you know, give me the elasticated waist, you know, <laughs> let, me, let me produce myself for myself, you know, how I want to be, not looking at myself through the kind of advertiser's lens, as it were. So I think we need to make a distinction between this, and I do worry that all, some of what we're seeing now is extending that pressure to look good ad infinitum. And where's that pressure coming from? Well, that pressure is coming from the fact that um, there's a lot of money to be made from the so-called grey and silver market. And there's also a lot of money to be made from exploiting anxieties about ageing. Because although what we're seeing here is a celebration of ageing, it can quite easily tip over into resisting ageing. You know, the age resistance industry is enormous. There's a lot of age shame around. You know, when people say, oh, doesn't she look fabulous? It means she's not looking old. And I, I interviewed this brilliant woman, Maggie Kuhn, who founded this um, uh, a, a movement in the United States called the Grey Panthers in the 1980s, who was a pioneer in this kind of way of thinking. And she said to me, and this was about, you know, 25, 30 years ago, she said to me, We'll know things have changed when you look your age is a compliment. <laughs> and, you know, we haven't got there yet at all, in spite of your best efforts. <laughs> I think that, that leads us very nicely on to our final speaker, um, who is a spa designer and writer and was just unmasked as the author of Spa Junkie in the uh, Financial Times, where there has, she's had a column for four years. So um, she's worked with the likes of Norman Foster, Rem Coolhouse, and Baz Luhrmann. Uh, please welcome Inga Theron. <laughs> so Inga, you are part of the industry. Um, you're going to tell us about it, that, 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 that is, is about us continuing to look good. So do you think there's necessarily a price to pay for looking um, hot and good? Well, I think I've been a human petri dish for the, for the Financial Times for four years. And I think, you know, whether it's my own blood, dragon's blood, lamb placenta, I've frozen things, I've injected things, I've been, you know, running around naked in fire pits to sort of try and unveil some of these secrets for my readers um, undercover. And I was brought on by Gillian de Bono because most of our readers are 40 plus, they're some of the most well-traveled, well-read, smart individuals, but we all succumb to this anxiety and there's this unregulated industry out there right now which just ravages on these fears and a lot of these people, you know, they, they are brilliant doctors at something previously, maybe it was a lung or a heart, but there's no more money to be made there. So what are they doing? Everyone's now a Botox. Um, um, filler or, or, or aesthetic doctor and it's just caused this 
awful um, uh, situation within the beauty industry, and I'm sure you've gone to so many parties where you just look at some of these faces of these women and you go, God, like, who did your face and make a note to self, don't <laughs> go there. <laughs> I'm just like, they look like crazy animals and what have we done? So I think I myself, as, um, as a writer and really someone who has no financial um, um, a hindrance, and I can see some of the very best doctors, and I have done, have found myself in so many Michael Jackson moments where I've had to wear a balaclava in the summer. I've had pocket skin like you cannot even imagine. I've had bruises in places you'd never even imagine. And I honestly swear to God, I'm still single, thought I would stay that way. And so I think, yes, to your point, I think at some point, one of the reasons why I invented um, what I did upstairs is there's a thing called the face gym. Um, is for this exact reason, we have to go back to basics. We have to go back to a holistic approach to things. It was during the six months of staying at home that I realized, God, like when I go to Barry's boot camp or I do gym and I eat well, I can see how my body changes, my muscles lengthen, tone and tighten and all these incredibly aggressive and invasive treatments I was doing to try and look hot at 39, <laughs> actually 100, um, <laughs> after everything I've done. Um, and actually, I don't actually even look that much better than what I should for all the money I've spent. And that's when I realized I have to go back to basics and treat the face like I treat the body, um, do the workouts, treat the muscles. There's 50 muscles in your face, work on those. You use um, special skin food for the face. And so, yes, to your point, I do think that there's a huge price to pay and we really need to get a sensibility check on it and age gracefully. I've actually found to contradiction to, to what you might um, have heard, but recently all the doctors I've been interviewing in America are saying most people are not worried about looking older. But no one wants to look tired. Tired is the biggest thing. They go and they go, Boost me up, I just look knackered. <laughs> so I think that's what we should try isn't and, and a address. That's euphemism though, isn't that the current euphemism for old? Because people don't want to say that, they just want to say, I look more tired than I am. I mean, I actually look as tired as I am. <laughs> <laughs> I think, but, you know. I know. I think that's a really good point. Mm, I think yeah. we are all looking tired because we're just all doing too much. Too much. What, what I've heard here, I think, is hugely heartening because you've all actually said this is about personality, individuality, style, being healthy, you know, doing the right things like eating well and exercising. And it's not about um, doing bonkers things and injecting, you know, lamp placenta or whatever. D does anybody want to disagree with that? Well, oh, go I on then. <laughs> um, and that you said that um, the, my kind of photographs and these women here kind of foster um, a sense of women having to look a certain way. I'm not saying your photograph. I love your you, you, you did in the Huffington now, hang Post. On just a minute. Just well, <laughs> let's, let's enlighten this audience because not everybody's read the Huffington Post. So she Anne, did in the Anne, what did you say and then how do you want to respond? Well, I, I, no, I think that, no, no, I, 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 I love your photographs, but they are all um, women as sylph-like as the two here. That's not true. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. I don't okay. think you've seen my book or my film. <laughs> okay, okay. okay. I have but, but one point that you said that I just think is important for all of us is women like these, women like the ones that I photograph, aren't dressing for other people, and I don't think they do feel that pressure. They're dressing for themselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's I so... I think that's a huge point that we have to talk about is... I, Every single woman, woman that I photographed or talked to feels more comfortable in her skin than she has ever felt before. And she no longer has to impress her lover or her boss or anyone. She's doing this because not only is it something that she's been trying to do her whole life, but now she's hit a point in her life where she can finally do it. And it's not an effort. Like, and you guys can speak to that. They do it because it's natural to them. They, I, I'm sure you're right. right? Say, I mean, you know, it, it's clear from, from these women. But the other point I have to say is, it, it's you know, not everyone can look like these women. No one's know. saying they should. And but you know, there, there's been a, a, a significant rise in eating disorders among older women, really all around the world. There's been a lot of research now over the last ten years, and obviously there are lots of reasons for that. But I would suggest that one reason is that we that older women are feeling under pressure. You know, it's why, like. Why? 
I think older women are smart enough to look at an image They're and not stop eating because, because of we're that. living in a culture that is so saturated by visual images, and there is a cultural norm of thinness and being svelte, and there's a lot of anxiety around body shape and image and, and that food. They read the article and they think, well, if I went to the gym or, you know, at um, Pilates or something like that, well, why wouldn't they go down that way and say, you know, why, why, don't, why don't I get like that? Well, you know... It's not asking a lot, is it? it? Well, I... I, I, mean, I, I, I mean, if you've got to be able-bodied, of course, I, I can understand to, that. I mean, what... Uh, uh, one of the things we know about ageing is that we become more different as we age and not more similar. And one of the key things is social class. You know, if you have, I'm not saying, you know, I mean, I know that you are, you know, the, th the queen of thrift stores <laughs> and, you know, are brilliant at <laughs> yeah, confecting yeah. TK Maxx, things. TK Maxx, £380, <laughs> 64 Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're, you're a brilliant... Also available at Selfridges. <laughs> <laughs> you're brilliant at doing that. But, you know, not everyone can do that. Not everyone can go off to the gym and do no, Pilates. No, no, I, I, no, and I, I think don't that, understand you know, that. It's, it's, it's worrying if this becomes the new kind of norm that we expect everyone to live by, is oh, all I'm we, saying. And we do... We, sorry, get Pam. I, I think that um, when women have, like, say, had a family or stopped working or whatever, it's suddenly like they're kind of bereft, you know, like the family's gone and they haven't got a life because when you're when you're bringing up children all your energy goes into like keeping house making sure your kids are fed making sure they can got sort of calm to do their exams and the rest of it and they haven't actually pursued as i didn't what i really wanted to do with my life and and it's you get to, it's like being a teenager again it's like like who am i yeah, mm -hmm. that is that is why teenagers get this anorexia. I mean, I have to admit that I had anorexia when I was young, <clears throat> and there are lots of reasons for it, and that's another story. But um, my answer to your thing about, about women having anorexia when they get older is like, look outside of yourself, don't focus on your looks, get a life, you know? <laughs> just just yeah, look at like politics, literature, go to the theatre, do all the things you've always wanted to do and you've never done before. Um, learn to paint, learn a musical instrument, get a bucket list, you know, <laughs> sort of, yeah. Instead I mean, I, of focusing on yourself, mm -hmm. because it's, it's no way to go, really. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I mean, I think Anne's not <coughs> saying anything we don't realise, which mm -hmm. is that the industry, mm -hmm. um, with all its photoshopping and its retouching, is, is, is perpetrating a, a, an image of women which isn't available to everybody. Mm. I mean, I think that's mm. the, 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 I don't think anybody would disagree with that, but what you're saying is it's about the resilience and the response to that, yeah. the personal yes. response to that. Because yeah. I think that from after the fashionistas, people have said that, they've seemed to be like revitalized because they've got to 60 and, and mm. like a, a woman said to me, you know, she loved Doc Martens when she was young, but she thought she'd look ridiculous in them at 60. Yeah. When, she said, why, why did I think like that? And I think it's made people, you know, sort of think, you know, you don't have to, you know, dress can, as you should. Can I raise sure. the obvious thing here? Because in the title of this debate, with its H's, it doesn't say women, and yet we've talked entirely about women. Is, is this a female issue? Are, are, do, do, are we, what, do we think men, Ari, do we think men are concerned about looking hot at 100? Um, I don't know if anyone's concerned with looking hot at 100. <laughs> I think that um, people are concerned with being alive at 100. People, <laughs> I think people are concerned with um, being healthy and feeling good and expressing themselves and being, you know, like I said before, part of the world. Um, you know, I've photographed hundreds of women and men who I've approached on the street, and I do think that there is obviously a stigma um, against. Uh, aging for both men and women, I think obviously women have a tougher time with that because of society. And you know, when you talk about an older man, you might say, oh, um, he's dapper, or there's just different language just associated with how you talk about an older man. But if, if a woman has wrinkles, it's like, the language yeah. is so different. Like, yeah. she looks haggard, she looks old, she looks yeah. tired. Yeah. And, and that's not a language, obviously, that I'm a part of, but I think society is. 
And I don't necessarily think men have that language put upon them, but they definitely feel the pressures. My dad is in his 60s. He had gray hair his whole life. I'm going gray now, and I love it. Um, but now he's 65, he started to lose his hair, and he dyed it black because he's afraid of getting older. He's the least vain person I know, but he doesn't want to look old. But he lives mm. in this culture. I don't think it's about being vain. I think it's very hard in this culture to kind of, you know, insulate yourself from all those anxieties. I think the, the, um, the stereotypes, if you like, and the pressures on men have been different from women because for women, they've been about how you look. And for men, they've been about how you are, how potent you are in every sense of the word. And that produces its own anxieties, mm. of course. I think, though, that the, the, the anxiety about appearance is beginning to percolate through to men with the fact that there's so much um, occupational insecurity and, and everyone's looking over their shoulder at younger people coming on. And, you know, so there's a lot, you know, I've got to look younger too. I think that is beginning to happen with mm. men. I want to, I'm going to, I'm, one more thing from, from Pam, but then I'm going to open it up. So if everybody can be ready with their thoughts and questions, um, do stick your hand up, but Pam first. I think that if people focus more, like when you're older, if the focus was more on being healthy, like eating properly, mm. because you immediately feel good. <clears throat> and it shows in the way you look. And I, I mean, yeah. Absolutely. Um, and I think that's, it's taking hold. Um, there's a lot of, of that actually happening people are more aware yeah people are more aware yeah. of all of that but yeah. um because if you're not feeling well <laughs> you're not going to look good <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah um okay there's a microphone is going to make its way to you um hello my name's amanda and i write a blog called the women's room blog and we write about women of um, 40 plus and all of our readers, and I think the majority of people here probably, all feel the same. We, we know old, getting older is, in some cases, invigorating and exciting, and certainly nothing to be frightened of. But we increasingly need to, to convince brands and retailers that we're a, a market that shouldn't be frightened, they shouldn't be frightened of. So I wonder if any of the panels have got any good ideas of how we convince brands that you know we are worth investing in. Well, I mean, that is a, a really interesting question because uh, I don't know if you know Julia Twigg's book about fashion and age. She did some. She's a, a professor of sociology at the University of Kent, and she's done really interesting work. And she's interviewed um, companies that produce clothing uh, designed especially for the older market, and how do they advertise it? using younger models. Yes. You know, there is the contradiction staring you in the face. Why? Because they say, oh, well, advertising is aspirational, and who wants to be old? Well, you can hardly aspire to get younger. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> I have an example. Um, in my work, I, all of a sudden, from people seeing my photos, people started to reach out to me to do campaigns for them, because I was showing women who are full of life and, and a kind of an alternative view of what we usually see when it comes to aging. And I shot a campaign for um, Karen Walker Eyewear, which is a very young brand. Um, most of her customers are in, in their teens. And she came to me because she loved the idea of photographing older women. So the campaign featured women 65 to 95. And all real women, all different sizes, all different economic backgrounds. And um, she came up to me. The campaign did very well, but it, it, it's not about me. She said that all of a sudden, older women started going to, into her stores around the world and saying, thank you so much for doing this. And they started buying her sunglasses, so it, it obviously helped the business. But they were just so happy to see women that they can relate to. And I've always been of the opinion that who can relate to a 14-year-old who's been photoshopped so she looks like she's 12 years old? Wouldn't we rather see an older woman, an older woman who has a great sense of themselves? Um, not only will younger women say, I can't wait to get older, I can't wait to look at that. I hear that all the time from younger women when they see the pictures on my blog. Um, and older women as well will respond to that. So it, it just makes more sense. And I think it's, we have to change the imagery of what we see. We have to change the image of older women in marketing and advertising, show real women who have a point of view. Ari, while I, as I say, I often how much I 
much I want to turn into the women you photograph. <laughs> but you, don't you think there's something about... I mean, Pam take, is part of the Guardian All Ages yeah. fashion shoot. And what I love about that, I mean, I can see that you're doing... You're a necessary corrective to the ageism of the advertising industry. But surely, ultimately, we want to integrate all the ages together. We don't want to call an age ghetto we want age to be less significant than it's being made to be by the, the the marketers there's already so many younger women featured in campaigns and obviously if it was an intergenerational thing that would be incredible and i constantly do projects where yeah. i incorporate in in and have um younger women engage with older women that's okay. a huge part of what what i do okay. personally i just did a project for a website where older women dressed younger women so they could kind of um, have mm -hmm. this relationship and, and, and see the expertise and wisdom of an older woman. But it's still, you need to put forcefully these images out there so people see them. Let's make a statement mm -hmm. and then be all inclusive. Mm -hmm. But okay. I think it's important just to get them out there. Mm -hmm. Did you want to come in, Pam? Um, I, I, was, I wanted to say when, when I was young, um, I mean, I, I'm, I'm mixed race, so I'm lucky in as much as I didn't wrinkle very early, but I, I met when I was 21 um, the godmother of, fr of a friend and she had the most incredibly wrinkled face and she was only in her 40s but she was, had a fascinating face because like your face is a map of all your of your emotional life from the year dot right and so your face is going to reflect who you are and and um, like I think the best beauty treatment in the world is a good laugh <laughs> you know you've got a smile uh, you, you mustn't admit, I, I used to be, when I was young, I was like desperately self-conscious when I was in my teens and workmen used to say things like, um, cheer up love, it will never happen <laughs> 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 to me in the street. So, I, you know, I did, but oh. since as I got older, obviously I've got a better sense of humour. We've got hands <coughs> shooting up all over the place, so I'm going to start with the, the there's a blonde haired lady there? Was that you? Sorry. Oh, sorry, <laughs> whoever's got the microphone, perfect, but let's go to you next. And then the lady of the orange, yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, this is a question uh, for Inga. You uh, mentioned these uh, beauty treatments ladies are having, like Botox and invasive procedures and fillers and whatever. And you said that you think that we should go back to a more holistic approach. Now, I've got teenage daughters, right? And they're being bombarded day in, day out from websites of these morons, like off TOWIE. Uh, you know, they're in their 20s, they've got injections in their face, they've got plastic things in their chest, they've got plastic bits, you know, hair extensions. I wouldn't want my daughters sticking a needle in their face um, because I want to build up their self-esteem, I want them to have self-worth, so they wouldn't need to feel that they need to do that to feel good about themselves. Now, my question to you is how do we get there? Because I just see women of my age looking like monsters and it just makes me stare even more because I think if that's going on on the outside, what's wrong with you on the inside? So I think the next generation now are going to be completely screwed and how do we undo that? Great, Inga. Do you, and let's take the microphone up there so we keep things. Thank well, you. I think you're addressing exactly what I tried to do with face gym. And, and again, I'm not prescriptive and I'm not saying there's a right or a wrong and I'm not saying don't inject, inject or, or, or do inject. But one thing I think that you make a good point. First, first, the first thing I want to answer is we don't even know what's happening to having injectables in your body for 40 years. If we're going to be living to 100, has Anyone had that? The fillers that are around today and the Botox that's around for enough has probably been here for like 10 years and it's quite stable. But the amount of fillers that people are putting in and what that does to your body, and if you're going to be injecting for 70 odd years, because most people and most doctors will tell you now that you should start injecting at 25 because that's before the oh, wrinkles yeah. actually start. <laughs> then you'll never be, you'll never have a wrinkle. So, fair enough. I mean, I get that, but God only knows what impact that has to your physical body. So I, I see a lot of women now getting ill. I, I feel that there's a lot of things coming along. And um, I without any you know, without any medical expertise, sure. I do think we're making ourselves ill and we really need to push it back to basics. 
But I think one thing, just to, I'll just make yeah. one, I think one thing that's really, really important, I think one of the reasons why Gillian de Bono got me involved with the Financial Times, and I've said this before and I'll say it again, the market is completely unregulated. Just because you've got a doctor in front of your name now means that people trust you because you trust the doctor. And if the guy brings out a needle and he starts injecting your face, most of the time he's learned it from, from a Korean who's made a video. Go on YouTube and you too can learn to give someone a, a facelift in 10 minutes. And it's shocking. So we have to push government to actually push for stronger legislation against this. Otherwise, we will have a huge, big problem. And then secondly, we have to start educating our children, which is why the face trim is up. Says I hate to be blagging, plugging it. I'm not. But it is going back to basics. Work out the muscles. There are 50 muscles in your face. Your skin lies on a bed of muscles. Work those muscles like you work it in the gym, and you will lift and tone and tighten your face without a Botox, without a needle, no downtime. I manage it shouting at my children. I use all those muscles. <laughs> but that ages you. Those age you. <laughs> but I just wanted to say that there is a, 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 um, quite a lot of evidence now that anxieties <coughs> about aging are setting in much, much earlier than ever before. I mean, I, I interviewed someone for my book, and she was just turning 26, and she said she was the only, out of all the women she knew, she was the only one who hadn't had Botox. I was completely shocked by that, absolutely shocked. So I think, you know, we are seeing kind of two counter movements happening at the same time. And this is why I think, you know, these women and, and advanced style are very important as a, as a campaigning tool to try and counter the other. But, you know, if you read the message boards, it's really terrifying. There was, there were, there was one that I, I looked at where these women were, had, you know, really a pathological fear of hitting 30. And you think, you know, what has gone wrong here? As ever, the discussion hops up towards the end. We do have some time. I'm going to ask people to be really quick at their points. Pam and then I think we've got two ladies up here, the blonde, blonde lady, excuse me, and the lady went orange. So, Pam, go. I think there's three points. Um, the lady over there who's talking about her daughters, I think you should tell them how beautiful they are every day. Great because you'll give them the confidence not to want to have to go down any sort of fixative route. Um, the, the reason why a lot of people do this is uh, this, this Western culture is so narcissistic. Yeah. You know, there's, there's other things in life apart from what you look like. Yeah. 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 My question mm -hmm. actually was to Pam. First of all, can I say thank you for the long hair? Because I think it's great that we can oh. keep our long hair over the age of 40. Yeah. But my question was, do you have to fight against people wanting to Photoshop you in photographs? Um, I don't. I don't know. I don't know. I don't think they do actually. I don't. Um, well, apart from one of my friends who, who um, gave me perfect teeth, <laughs> <laughs> which would be great. <laughs> Cost me a lot of money, and I don't get that much money from modelling. I have to say, but. Um, no, I, I, I guess I don't do that. I mean, people know me because I do The Guardian, but I, I haven't actually done an awful lot of um, fashion modelling, really. Right. Um, so I'm open to offers. Lady and Orange, <laughs> I'll come to you next. Right. Um, first and foremost, I'd like just to um, s um, applaud Selfridges for holding a, um, a lecture like this because I really believe, I work in the beauty industry, I have the privilege of working with children right up to women in their 90s as a makeup artist. And without a doubt, I really do believe that there, we are in the cusp of a beauty revolution, and hence an, an evening like this is brilliant. Um, however, the only thing that I'd like to contribute is I think until we start um, or stop using the language that we currently do around age, words such as war against aging, age-defying, anti-aging, I sincerely hope that they will become obsolete as we now are in the mm. 21st century. Yeah. And it's not about the image of a woman, as Ari had spoken. I think that's a, it's about age acceptance, beauty acceptance, and beauty empowerment. And let's really get the media and some of the leading skincare brands to address the words used around aging, and perhaps that would stop our anxiety. I think it's a really yeah. excellent point. Yeah. We've got yeah. Yeah. There's um, two ladies here fighting for that. Oh. <laughs> Take it in turns. There's, um, there's a lovely um, lady comedian who wrote about she was walking down Oxford Street, and she 
was really tired and she looked in Dr. Scholl's and thought, mmm, they look comfy. <laughs> I would like to thank these ladies for making comfy shoes look hip. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, uh, and your neighbour. Oh, hi, I'm, I'm Raga. I, I've travelled a lot and I've noticed that the traditional women don't seem to need to do anything. Uh, they love dancing and talking and being together and sharing and being um, involved in maybe just bringing up their children, whatever. And I think we need to uh, stop worrying about ourselves perhaps a bit o over here in Britain. I think we're targeted a lot and uh, I don't watch television and I, I think that uh, we, we just need to make ourselves immune to uh, worrying. Uh, people are trying to make us anxious and uh, that there's a big industry in that. So uh, I think we can have a lot of fun and that's what I do. I stay with lots of different people. I really enjoy socializing. I really enjoy going around the charity shops and uh, just talking to people, whoever happens to be in there find out all kinds of things about what's going on in life. And I don't worry about myself so much. Doesn't mean that I don't get depressed. But I think our culture does that to us. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of loneliness. And I don't want to be lonely. My, my way to, um, to enjoy myself is to avoid that sense of being in a box and cut off from what's going on in life. Does anybody? We, we, we risk um, being in total agreement here about these things. Does anybody want to disagree with, any, with anything that's been said so far? Brilliant, brilliant. We've got three hands have gone up, and I'm going to take the lady at the I'm back really first. I'm disagreeing. I'm oh. going to get in there. Oh, go on. It, um, what I, I would like to talk to the person about the, um, with the children, um, from being in the film with Jean, what I learned through sort of um, challenging the media in that is that the media emphasis on everyone being 16 stick insects. Um, the challenge to that I want to do as an educationist after that film is go into schools and talk with young people about aging, just about getting older. What do they think about that? and then maybe show clips of the film, because that'll be negative, I think. This is simplistic, but it'll be negative. You know, it'll be everything that the media has given them, which will be, you have to be thin, you have to be 16 forever. And that is your an answer to yours, Anne, about aging has got to be positive. And it is positive with all of us that were Absolutely. in the film. We were, we, were, we were all ages and all sizes. I mean, we weren't all ages, we weren't 16. But I mean, we were all older ages and we were all sizes. And we weren't all brilliantly dressed and brilliantly affluent. But the school situation is that children are, as you said, are really becoming victims of the media in that they need to look good forever and good is 16. So what, are, what is after, sorry to go on, but what is after showing the film, which I want to think, you know, the negative things will come out, show a clip of the film, and then positive things will obviously come out from what they've seen. And then going around, you know, the world, talking about that is, is I think, a campaigning seal that I have. Let's move on to the lady with the hat. <laughs> Okay, um, it's something that I would like to throw into the discussion because somehow it has not been mentioned at all. We kind of, it is in the title. We have talked about men feeling anxiety about their potency, but one of the main issues about women getting older is uh, their sexuality and the fact that women after the age of 50 are no longer sexual beings. Does it mean that sexuality ends at 50? Who wants to take that question? Yeah. Does, does sexuality end at 50? What? No. <laughs> 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 Anne, do you want to? Well, I mean, you, you would think so. I mean, there has been such a taboo against the whole idea of old, and I think that's part of the prejudice against older women. It's to do with the idea of we can't bear to think of our mothers having had sex, you know. So older women are identified with our mothers. What we know about older women and sexuality is that there are lots and lots of different variants. 
There are women like my mother, may she rest in peace, who used to tell us how active her sex life was with my father <laughs> into their 90s. <laughs> uh, you know, God, my sister and I are kind of, you know, desperately trying to keep up. There are, there are uh, women who are thrilled to be at the back of all of that. There are women who would love to have more sex if they could jolly well find it. There are women who find themselves sexually. I've got a friend who hasn't been in a relationship for 15 or 20 years. She's coming up to 68, and whoa, she's been active recently. Um, so, you know, we've got to stop the, 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 the stereotype. We've got to allow people to be sexual creatures or not be sexual creatures at any age. I but think. I think what our questioner, has, what our questioner has, has done is equate the word hot with sexual which nobody had done so far. Um, and if we're saying, is there a link between looking good and being sexually attractive? I mean, we know there is, but in your heads, is there? Is that part of why you want to look good? Obviously, obviously <laughs> if you look good, I mean, I, I, I'm, people tell me I'm obsessed with nutrition, but I, I think it's very important. And if you're well nourished, then obviously your sex drive is going to be good. And you're, you're, you're going to, your skin's going to look good, your hair's going to look good, you're going to have energy. So it's sort of like no brainer, really. But you're, you're the same. You're the same person. Just because you're 70 or 80, up here you're not. You're 30. <laughs> you, so, you know, why, why wouldn't you be sexual? Or, I don't understand why people sort of say that. Why are you going to be sort of thought as old because you look old? You're not really old, you're just. Looking old. So I guess it's the whole thing. I think you know. In cultures where women don't go through a menopause, third world they? cultures, yeah, because of because of the, their lifestyle, their diet, and everything else. Mm. Yeah. So it's a very um, Western civilization thing. Inga, did you want to come in? You're only as old as the man that you're feeling, <laughs> <laughs> the or the woman that you're feeling. The old I, lines I, are the best. <laughs> <laughs> did you want to come in? Um, it's hard for me to comment on this, but I have... Um, You're the only man on the panel. <laughs> on my blog, I interviewed one of the ladies in my film, Joyce Carpati, who's 82. And if you asked her what hot was, she would say, you know, just feeling good about herself. Um, but I did a whole post about her talking about sex after 80, so you guys should read it. Uh, <laughs> we've got a couple more questions. I'm going to take, there's a lady with a hand up at the back, and then, then you, madam. Yeah, so Go just to it. kind of pretext my um, statement, I'm 28. Um, I want to mention two things. Number one, I think, picking up from your th thread, hot actually means different things to different people. So at the age of 28, I want an ass like Kim Kardashian and boobs like Kelly Brook. That's what hot means to me. Maybe when I'm in my 60s and 70s, hot means a sense of self, a sense of vitality, a sense of wellness. I think it does mean different things to different people. Um, the other thing, just at the risk of kind of this evening being a little self-congratulatory, I just want to pick up on the, the point that this lady mentioned here in front of me. You equated um, plastic surgery or injections to people not having any self of sense of self-confidence. Yeah, self-esteem. So yeah, I really, I really don't think that that's actually quite accurate. I think what you're saying is, is that anyone who chooses to do something to themselves means that they must have a problem with who they are, and I just think that's not true, actually. Much like these ladies here choose to wear whatever makes them feel good about themselves, people that have injectables or Botox or whatever, maybe that just makes them feel good. They don't necessarily, they're not insecure. That, that might be your, your personal view. So I just wanted to kind of bring, bring that point up. Actually, sometimes these things just make people feel great, and why shouldn't you celebrate that? So they feel good and then this makes them feel great. Yeah, why not? I d so better than they felt before. Yeah, exactly. Okay. We're just happy with themselves, much like yeah. putting on a nice dress will make you feel great or eating a cheesecake will make you feel great. Whatever they choose to do with their bodies, it's their bodies and it doesn't well, necessarily equate to insecurity. Anybody want to come back on that? I agree with that. Yeah. Why? If you, that, that makes you feel better in yourself, you've only got one life, you feel better, well, do that. I've got nothing against that, definitely not. Yeah. I think we were just saying it's not in excess. I'm, I agree with you. I'm not prescriptive at all. And I think if you are doing it in moderation, it's just I don't think there's enough education or enough science around uh, the long-term effects of this. And I think you'll agree as well. When you do see what some women are doing to themselves, you wonder if they've got some kind of weird morphing going on, what they see in the mirror. Because what I see and what I think what they looked like 10 years ago and what they look like today, they, they were a beautiful woman. And I think if they'd aged gracefully, back to that language again, it's not anti-aging, it's just aging gracefully. Perhaps if we put less pressure on people 
and um, we allowed them to just not overdo it. You could do it in moderation and feel good. Maybe that's the, there's, a, there's a, a bit of balance there, I think, perhaps. Yeah. And th thank you for giving us a, another view on this. We've got a lady here. Um, one thing which hasn't been mentioned is the fact that if we do reach 100, uh, majority of us would have been dead already from the age of 70. It's because dementia, dementia hasn't been mentioned. And I think we really need to, I mean, I think, you know, it's great what you're doing, but I think we need to emphasize the gymnastic of the mind rather than the gymnastic of the, the body and what we look like. And the two, I think we have two shocks really in life. Um, you mentioned it, Anne. And the first one is, I must admit, when I did reach 60, I thought, well, that's not me. Who's, who's this person? You know, I just did not recognize myself. And the second one is when you are actually caught up with dementia, yeah. and then you think, you, you know, you've gone away, and you don't know who this person is. So I think there is drama within all this, and I think it's good to look at age, and perhaps the title should have been How to Look at Age. Mm -hmm. itself, you know, and just talk about it, female or male. Yeah. Thank you. Anne. Can, I, can I just say, I mean, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up, um, but because I wanted to actually change the title to how to be vital, you know, throughout one's life course. Um, I, I don't know if any of you saw the panorama um, uh, last night uh, on care homes, yes. which was yeah. really, really shocking. So the question really, you know, the abuse of old people in, you know, how to retain dignity. Um, there are a quarter of a million uh, older people in this country who because of cuts in social services now haven't got help in the home and cannot get dressed by themselves or, or be bathed. So we're talking about, you know, how you look, mm. you know, getting dressed for them would be. And I think dementia is a very, very important issue. What we need to focus on is how we make, and there are, a lot of, there are a lot of interesting projects, a lot of interesting discussions about this now happening, how to make our cities and our environment age-friendly. Because once we make it friendly for the more vulnerable people, we make it friendly for everyone. And I'm afraid at the moment we're going almost in, in many respects in the opposite direction because everything is the bottom line, everything's been privatized, everything's been cut. We need to think about how we can make things gentler and enable, the, you know, you age better, not if you're a ruthless, single-minded person, but actually if you're more engaged with other people. The, the, if I can just say one last thing, the thing I liked most was that there was um, a survey done of volunteers, and a 90-year-old woman answered, and they said to her, why are you a volunteer? And she gave a two-word answer. She said, personal growth. <laughs> at 90. <laughs> Fabulous. Um, I promised it would be a wide-ranging debate, and I think it absolutely has been. I think we're pretty much coming to the end now. I'm looking at my timekeeper here. But I do want to ask each of you, um, for if, you if there was one piece of advice that you were going to give in terms of ageing, how to approach ageing, how to do it well, how to, uh, how to look good, how to feel good, if you could encapsulate it in one thing, um, just one answer from each of you to take away. <laughs> this is, again, not, not a question for me to answer, but I can, I, I'll, I'll answer it in terms of um, one of the women that I photographed, and her name is Deborah Rappaport, and she always says, look good, feel good, feel good, look good. And um, she does yoga, she um, eats healthy, she's active, she's creative, and she lives a very creative life. I think the secret is to have a passion for something. Mm. <clears throat> in life really so it's, um, laugh, laugh, oh. laugh. yeah like uh, Pam said keep interested in life mm. um, yeah. yeah keep like in what's like going on laugh. I think mm. that's so important laughing yeah it's a wonderful thing mm. and well I'll say two things for me actually I take up what you say dancing I try and dance each weekend um, <laughs> but actually um, being open to new ideas and learning. You know, my husband's going to turn 80 in September and he's just bought a new saxophone. Ooh. He just started learning the saxophone. Ooh. And, uh, you know, he is a model. I, ju I just want to be like him, really. That's lovely. Great. 
And finally, I mean, I, I, I sort of second everything. I think you just have to stay curious. You know, stay curious, increase your bucket list, be happy, and ultimately, you know, if you can do a few tweaks here and it does make you feel good, like eating that piece of cheesecake or you want to have a little wrinkle taken away <laughs> or something nipped and tucked, if it makes you happy, then by all means do so. Keep a balance, keep an open mind, stay curious and just be happy. Great. And lots of sex. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you. Um, thank you to all our speakers. You've been great. Um, thank you to you all for coming along tonight. I hope it's been enjoyable and, um, and a, a good way to spend the evening, the, the hour before dinner. Um, thank you to Selfridges for hosting the event, to Intelligence Squared for making it happen. Thank you all very, very much for coming and hope to see you again.